Welcome to Marketplace Live. Let's defy gravity. Hello, I'm Dave McCrory, and I'm going to talk to you today about data gravity and the data gravity index and how data gravity is growing. So a little bit about me, I'm the VP of Growth uh, and Global Head of Insights and Analytics, and I'm one of the creators of the Data Gravity Index. Prior to joining Digital Realty, I ran a data consulting business called Data Gravitas LLC. Um, before that, uh, I spent uh, a decade doing startups, two successful uh, startups. I also coined the term data gravity in 2010 in a blog post. I have 10 patents. I was SVP of engineering for Warner Music Group, CTO for Basho Technologies. Uh, they were one of the early NoSQL distributed database vendors. And I was also VP of engineering for GE Digital's uh, IoT and machine learning group. So a little context uh, about what we're going to cover today. Digital Realty is in a unique vantage point. Uh, we have the view of service providers that are customers of ours, as well as enterprises. So we are able to see a lot of different things occurring across our 284 data centers, 48 metros, over 4,000 customers, and as you can see, a large amount of investment to create and combine all of this. This gives us a viewpoint into what's happening in data centers globally. And what we've seen is a lot of data. Uh, there's a data creation life cycle that you can see. This is from people and things creating data. Uh, so you can think about every time you use your smartphone or you check out at a grocery store or anything else that is generating data and not just the data of the interaction itself or the transaction, but there's a lot of other things happening in the background. There are analytics, there are lots and lots of derivative data being created. And as this data is created, there's processing happening and even more data is then created. There's post analysis and that data is often stored and then reanalyzed again uh, for historical purposes. So this creates an explosion of data in this data creation life cycle. And there are a lot of influencing factors uh, with this. There is enterprise data stewardship. So how do you properly deal with all of the data? Um, where do you keep it? Uh, the fact that enterprises are the main drivers of data and housers of data. There are mergers and acquisitions taking place and how do you resolve the way data is being stored in one business versus another and then combine that data, often making even more copies of the data. In addition, we're digitizing more and more and more. Everything that we can take from the physical world and bring into the digital world, we are. Uh, if you think of all of the uh, sensors and IoT and smartphones and all of these things, they are all helping foster this process even further. There's data localization, so not only trying to keep data locally based on requirements, um, but the performance benefits of having data locally to you versus having data strewn out all over a network or the internet. And finally, there are cyber and physical requirements, security. Um, there are lots and lots of needs to make sure that this data is kept private and secure. So when we looked at all of this, we said, how do we bring all of this together and rationalize it into something that can be simplified? And that's where the formula for the Data Gravity Index came in. Uh, you can see the formula right now, data mass times data activity times bandwidth divided by latency squared. Data mass is the amount of data that's being held or that is at rest. 
data activity is data in flight or data in motion or things that are happening with the data. That could be transactions, that could be transformation, that could be moving data over the network. Any of those things um, could be classified as data activity. And finally, bandwidth. Uh, without enough bandwidth, uh, you just can't make data move. You can't do enough with the data. So bandwidth is something I like to think of as lanes on a highway. The more lanes you have, the more traffic that can travel across a highway at any given uh, second. And then we divide all of that by latency, but we square the latency. So latency you can think of as the speed limit of the highway. So the higher the speed limit, the faster the cars can go, and, um, and so the less time it takes. Latency is time, and the higher the latency, in this case, the slower. Uh, so the slower means the longer it takes. If you've ever played a video game online and it kind of lagged or stuttered or something else, that likely was due to latency. So we square the latency because it is so um, impactful. If you have enough latency, there's no difference between latency and downtime. Imagine if you were trying to do um, look at your bank account information and the latency was 10 minutes. Uh, you would assume that the bank s system is not working properly and you would probably just quit and try again another time. So once we crack the code of being able to understand data gravity with this formula, we then began to, to dive in. We looked at Global 2000 Enterprises as a, as a proxy for all business. Uh, so if you think about the Global 2000, they have a spread across many countries, business units. They spend a great deal on all sorts of services, whether it be IT and network or something like SaaS or Colo. And they have a large number of employees. So they are running truly some of the largest infrastructures in the world, and these are all globally distributed. So much easier to view these companies as kind of the bellwethers of what will happen across all companies over time. So we took that data and we analyzed thousands of attributes, identified data mass and activity to measure. We then calculated all of that industry data mass and activity and we quantified that with the enterprise data creation life cycle that I described earlier. So with that, we created a series of insights and we put those insights into the data gravity index. And these are taken from the data gravity index 1.0. Uh, you can see here the global data gravity intensity forecast is 139% CAGR. So from 2020 through 2024, a constant 139% CAGR is a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, that's because data is growing at an incredible pace. The number of applications that are consuming that data and then creating more data are growing incredibly rapidly. And the amount of data we want to store is growing at an incredible pace as well. This leads to the regional view. And if you look, you'll see that uh, APAC has 153% CAGR, which is just incredible. And it's followed by North America at 137%. The standout, though, is EMEA at 130%. 3% CAGAR, but if you look at the absolute amount of data gravity that EMEA is pushing, it's, uh, it's incredible. This means uh, even more activity coming than we've already seen in EMEA, and this is driven by a whole number of different reasons, some of which we outline in the data gravity index. In addition to that, we provided a, an, a metro to um, a metro forecast across all 21 metros that we analyzed. 
So you see some highlights uh, such as Dallas, uh, you'll see Hong Kong, uh, you'll also see Sydney, and you'll see uh, most of all the 200% CAGR of Singapore, which uh, is mostly due to the business activity and the overall bandwidth and general low latency that Singapore has uh, to all of the other metros. These, uh, these are also uh, delved into a little bit deeper in the uh, Data Gravity Index report. I'm now going to announce the Data Gravity Index version 1.5, uh, which will be available in a few weeks. The Data Gravity Index 1.5 uh, has some quite substantial new things in it. First and foremost, you'll see appearing on the screen 30 plus new metros that we've added to the Data Gravity Index report. This represents quite a few new and upcoming uh, metros that provide lots and lots of interesting data points to consider when looking at where, uh, where your business should potentially go next. In addition to the 30 new metros, we've included analysis in 20 plus different industries. And in the report, we highlight some of these industries, and later on, we'll delve into others uh, post the report. You can see it's a pretty comprehensive list. In addition to that, we dive in and do some highlighting. Uh, so you can see here, this is looking at banking and finance in 2020 versus 2024 across a large number of different metros in Europe. And you'll see on the left, the darker colors represent greater data gravity intensity, and as you get to lighter colors, it represents a less or lower data gravity intensity. And on the right, the same thing, except you'll notice that there are more dark uh, circles, and that's because the data gravity intensity has increased uh, quite a bit in many of the different metros. So not just looking at banking and finance, we look at pharmaceutical and chemical. You can see here, uh, this is uh, APAC, and you can see the difference between 2020 and 2024 is considerable. You'll notice the, uh, you'll notice the giant circle on the left uh, that is a medium blue, and then on the right it becomes that dark blue. That actually represents Tokyo. Uh, you'll see uh, Sydney gets darker as well. Um, as well as quite a few other metros um, in many different countries. And finally, we look at uh, insurance in North America. And you'll see lots and lots of circles on the left um, that are already, um, a fair number of them are darker. And then when you look on the right, uh, there are considerably more dark uh, circles. This is all representing intensity increases. The data behind all of these increases um, is represented in the Data Gravity Index 1.5 report. So you'll get to see a lot more um, of the reasoning and details behind that uh, in 1.5. So 1.5 includes 30 plus new metros, major industry highlights, and major industry forecasts. It's, uh, it's really a step forward in the index and uh, there will be an index 2.0 which will take things even further. So looking at all of this and what is happening with data gravity, uh, what does it actually mean? What are the implications? The implications are a requirement for a change in architecture. Most things today are architected in IT infrastructure to move the data to the processing. And this simply doesn't work in the long term. In the long term, you have to move things to the data. Data is what's growing at an exponential rate today. And so to cope with that, you have to move everything to, nearer to the sources of data or to data collection or aggregation points. And so that means a shift in data and IT architecture so that the data is at the center. 
data is the center of gravity uh, when you consider the implications of things such as edge, such as multi-tiered uh, data center designs, such as trying to deal with highly distributed architectures. You have to deal with the data and consider the data first. The other implication is a connected community. So all of this data is beneficial to both you and your partners and customers. So creating a connected community where all of the other potential users of this data are in the same shared multi-tenant facility gives you far more advantage than trying to in real time replicate that data to dozens of different data centers simultaneously or deal with all the complexities that would involve that. Instead, being able to operate in a shared environment benefits everyone. It will allow your customers to get and interact with their information much faster. And it will also allow your partners to do more work and provide you with more data in a much faster and more efficient manner. So really, you have to invert the architecture and you have to have a connected community approach in order to have a successful uh, solution really in the future. So next steps. First, if you're attending this session, you will receive the updated Data Gravity Index 1.5 via email when it's released. And second, uh, if you didn't get to attend this session and are seeing it later, or you would like others to get a copy of this, of the Data Gravity Index 1.5, sign up at datagravityindex.com to get the 1.5 upon release. Thank you.